which will be to introduce myself. So, hey, wait a minute. We are live. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. It is um, 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time here in Utah. And so we are here for the third of six live virtual classes for Juneteenth. We thank you so much for coming and joining us today, for spending your Juneteenth um, and honoring our ancestors in this way by participating with us in this Roots Tech and Family Search Live event. Um, like I said, we're, we're now on our fourth of six classes today. We're gonna be talking about unveiling partnerships and accessing and using cohabitation records on Family Search. One of the tips and tricks in, in doing African-American research is really going after and focusing on maybe some of those little lesser known resources that can help you along the way. And, and I'm joined today by Tania Kuntz. I'll introduce her in a second, but I just wanna make sure for all of you who may be joining for the first time that you realize, one, this class is being recorded. It's, it's being broadcast now, be recorded and be available after today's broadcast, as well as all of our other sessions will be available that we're doing today. But it's not just today only. Um, at Roots Tech, we have been valuing diversity and inclusion for a long time, and we want to make sure that we honor the strength and the resilience and, and the triumphs of African American, the African American community throughout history. And so we've recorded several African American genealogy courses that are on rootstech.org. If you go to rootstech.org, you can log in and, and create your own Roots Tech account and create your own playlist and search for all the content that we've gathered in the last three years from our Roots Tech genealogy conferences and be able to look at them all month long. And not just for the month, but in June, we're focusing on African-American family history, but you can watch it even beyond June. And we hope that these classes that we're doing today, particularly this one, will be something that you add to your playlist and your library to help you. We, we've got something for you there. And in today's sessions, regardless of your skill level, whether you're a beginner trying for the first time and, and not really sure how to, how to start, or if you are a seasoned genealogist and are into DNA and wanna know how to leverage DNA to take your research to the next level, we've got something for you. Um, and, and when we say we, well, I'm a part of that group. <laughs> My name is Tom Reed, for those of you who don't know. Um, I work for Family Search as a program manager for African Heritage Initiatives in North America. I do my best to help Family Search cater to an African American audience, the needs and the motivations, the records, the, the discovery experiences, everything that you need to have a joyful family history experience is what I try and help facilitate on behalf of our organization, as well as connect and work with and represent various genealogical organizations and professional genealogists in the Black genealogy community um, through my relationships with them, through relationships with folks like our next presenter. So I want to introduce you to none other than Tania Kuntz, who is, I love how she describes herself, an enthusiastic genealogist. You will get that from her as we talk today. <laughs> She's got a long-standing passion for, explain, for exploring family history with more than 20 years of professional expertise in information science, research, and information organization. She's only 22 years old, so she's been doing this since she was two <laughs> years old, y'all, and she's amazing. <laughs> Mia volunteers extensively in the genealogy community with current leadership roles in the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society as the National Treasurer of OGS and the Nashville Chapter President. OGS is what we refer to that organization. You'll hear um, uh, more about them a little bit later. And um, she's with the US Gen Web Project as a national representative at large. She also runs an Academy of Legacy Leaders Facebook community, thriving community. She, she takes so much of her own time to facilitate education, inspiration, and family history. I have come to love Tania on TikTok um, and her, share, her sharing her little genealogy bits. And so I want to introduce her to you and, and let her tell you more again about um, unveiling partnerships, accessing and using cohabitation records on family search. Tania, welcome. Thank you. Well, so glad you're here. 
Well, thank you so much, Tom. I'm delighted to be here as well and participate in this wonderful series of classes that y'all are offering today for our Juneteenth holiday. So I appreciate what y'all are doing. I'm glad to be part of it. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, we'll let you, you have a presentation for us today. Yes, to I do. I do, I do have some slides. I believe you need to project them to the uh, screen. Is that correct? Yes. So hold on. Oh, I, did I not pull up the slides yet? Ah, um, here we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Well, I am so very much looking forward to sharing this information with everyone today. And, you know, Tom, of course, interject as you see things that really relate to you or as you see people asking questions, I'm happy to stop at any moment and elaborate if needed. Uh, thank so, you. I just want to say to, to everybody on that note, thank you from Arkansas, New Jersey, New Hampshire, California, and even our neighbors to the north in Canada. Thank you all for joining us today for this presentation. Yeah, what a great representation we're seeing. So the title of the talk is Unveiling Partnerships, and we're here to talk about cohabitation records at Family Search. And as Tom alluded to, these are the records that may not be as well known as some other record types, but can be instrumental for us that are researching African ancestored ancestors and family members and relatives. And Family Search has some great resources for that. So we're gonna step you through the history of cohabitation records and what's available for you to take advantage of. Um, Tom mentioned that I'm a member of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. So, you know, that, that is part of our mission is to help educate and to have opportunities to present in forums like this is wonderful. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and make sure I can advance my slides. And yes, here we go. Well, I wanted to start with a bit of a personal story, if I could, because I think it helps just raise awareness of how cohabitation records can help us. So I began my family history journey about 19 years ago, and my family's from Eastern North Carolina. And when I was getting started, I soon learned about a publication by Dr. Barnetta McGee White called Somebody Knows My Name. So Dr. White had done extensive work to transcribe cohabitation records in North Carolina and published a three volume set. And I found my ancestors among the pages of the work. So I was looking at this, the section for Edgecombe County, North Carolina and saw my ancestors, Alan Wimberly and Della Battle. And I learned some important details from what I saw here. It tells me that they have been cohabitating since 1842, that they have 12 children. And importantly, it also connected them to their slave holder because these were records that were specifically from the plantation of Kent Plummer Battle. So by discovering these records, it led me to be able to craft more stories about my family, what they experienced, what they went through. Um, and I really just found them instrumental in that process. You know, I was able to confirm and learn about my ancestor's brother. Dred Wimberly was one of the children of Allen and Della. He was a state a black state senator in North Carolina post-reconstruction. I was able to learn more about Kemp Plummer Battle and you know the network of plantations that he owned and some more details about my family. So I share this because records have impact. They help us connect to our ancestors even more. And Tom, I'm sure you hear stories like this regularly as you interact with the community. Oh, we've been hearing them all more and more. <laughs> yep. amazing. Yes, it is amazing. So, and then to be able to actually see the record, one day I was on Family Search and lo and behold, it popped up. And I thought, wow, I didn't know the cohabitation records were there. <laughs> this was several years ago. So if we look at the document, you see Alan Wimberly, Della Battle, and then the side says, these are the papers of Kent Plummer Battle. So that was really important for me to discover that Family Search had this as a resource. So what I'll do is I'll talk about the creation of cohabitation rec records, and I'm going to start with the role of the Freemans Bureau, because the Freemans Bureau definitely played a critical part in helping to document um, marriages between formerly enslaved persons. So we're going to have a little history lesson here. <laughs> so. So as we know, there was the ratification of the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, and that was a significant milestone when it comes to the creation of these records, because it was after emancipation that there was a need to make sure that these unions were legally represented, legally acknowledged, and legally verified, because um, that was their purpose, is to legitimize these partnerships, these unions. And 
Cohabitation records are important because you'll find that they are among the earliest records that contain a lot of information about those that were formerly enslaved because it's right after emancipation that we start to see them being created. And they include a variety of, a variety of details. We're gonna see some examples later on, but names, ages, places people were born, information about the persons who were their slaveholders and even how long they've been together as a couple. So I'm excited to be able to share some of that as we talk. So after emancipation in May 1865, the Bureau of Refugees, Freemen and Abandoned Lands, I know has been mentioned probably several times today, also known as the Freemans Bureau, is formed. Tom, you'll recognize this graphic, won't you? <laughs> because it's from Family Search. Oh, I'm about to say that. I was like, I haven't seen that in a few years. <laughs> but it goes to, it shows just how many individuals were affected. There were 4 million African Americans that were freed after the Civil War. And so this is a large population. And the Freemans Bureau worked to help provide services to facilitate the, you know, the the information, the resources, the services that the community needed in order to become, you know, become more into this, their citizenship. And the services that the Freemans Bureau offered definitely was a variety. Everywhere from giving rations and clothing, providing medical care, helping with labor contracts and disputes as that may arise, um, providing transportation, you know, think about how much disenfranchisement there was in our community and people needed to reunify and come back to their families. And the Freemans Bureau provided services to help that. And importantly for our conversation here today, the Freemans Bureau helped legalize marriage. Now the Freemans Bureau, let me get back over here. The Freemans Bureau, the commissioner was Major General Oliver Otis Howard, the namesake of Howard University. And in May of 1865, towards the end of the month, he released a circular. And in his circular, he stated that in places where the local statutes make no provisions for the marriage of persons of color, the assistant commissioners, those were the individuals that reported to him, are authorized to designate officers who shall keep a record of marriages, which may be solemnized by any ordained minister of the gospel. So he releases this circular, and it wasn't so much that this is what started the recording that was done, because in some places recordings were already being done, but it helped, you know, communicate the importance of doing it. Now, what we of course see is that in practice, it wasn't always that straightforward. Registrations of the Freemans Bureau varied state to state. They did not do it consistently in all locations. Here we also have a map visualizing the states where the Freedmen's Bureau operated, as you may imagine, right? So Southern states and border states. And I have some examples to show you just how varied the practice was. So let's look at the state of Alabama. In September, 1865, the state convention ordered that unions among persons who had been formerly enslaved were legal, but they gave no guidance. They did not proactively seek to register anyone. They just said, yeah, if you're married, it's valid. But they did not really work to document it. Now, they did do a state census in 1866 that recorded the entire state's population, including persons of color, by name. Now, this is a census that has only the head of the household. So it's a little difficult to make it you know, a source for cohabitations. But perhaps there might be some clues there if you're trying to research that. But in the case of Alabama, those, those recordings didn't really exist. DC is a different scenario. In DC, they set up offices to establish and register marriages. So this was important. And so they were registering people's cohabitations and unions. And people often came from neighboring states like Maryland and Virginia. Louisiana, Tennessee, and Mississippi. I list all these together because they, they worked kind of in tandem, but they have there, is, there are marriage uh, records from the Freedmen's Bureau for these states. They did work to do some of these registrations. Now, Tennessee and Mississippi would enact laws by 1867 to uh, require uh, registration and require marriages be documented. So in these states, the time period is really 1865 to about 1867 that we see some Freedmen's Bureau record of marriages. Now, if anyone is online and watching even now or later, and you are from the states of North Carolina and Virginia, oh, you're really in a good, good position because in these states, the state legislatures in 1865 created laws, laws requiring that uh, persons who have been formerly enslaved become 
acknowledged legally um, in the county records. So the Freedmen's Bureau actually did not need to do this work because the states legislated it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. There, there's a question that's come through about okay. um, specifically, um, are they listed as cohabitation records via the Freedmen's Bureau in every state? How, how are they kind of documented if, if how would someone know that, that what you've described here are these records? It varies, right? Sometimes they'll call them marriage as a freed person. They'll use terms like slave marriage records. There's no consistent terminology for okay. how they're characterized. That's a very good question. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and, yeah. and, you know, would every enslaved person, I think this is Joyce Ann Haney is asking, would every enslaved person be registered? They're not, you know, she's not able to find any on her family. No, not every person is registered because these these listings didn't be created in every county, in every location. Um, it was not systematic across the whole population. So they are spotty in many cases. But when you find something that's for your family, hey, it's a, it's a treasure to, uh, to hold. But unfortunately, there will be many people who were missed. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Joyce, mm -hmm. for those questions. Keep them coming in. As you have comments or questions, let us know. We're happy to address them kind of as we go along the way. So continue to me. Thank you. This is good. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do have a reference here on the slide that's a really good resource if you want to understand the variations among the different states. It's an article that was in a National Archives publication back in 2005. And I will comment, I am going to share my slides with anyone who's interested. So I believe our moderator behind the scenes is sharing the link, um, but I also have a link at the end. So I will be sharing slides if you want them, you can have them. <laughs> so, all right. So how do we get to these records of the Freedmen's Bureau? Well, Family Search has a nice database that we have access to. It's called United States Freedmen's Bureau Marriages from 1861 to 1872. And we have the opportunity through this database to search across around 20,000 records from 11 states and the District of Columbia. And you can see the states listed here on the description for the database. Um, and it works much like any other family search database. You enter the people you're looking for, information about them, and explore your results to see if you're able to locate something that matches your family needs. So what I wanna do now is just go through some examples to show you the variety we see in these records. So this is one example from DC. It's a page of uh, listings of cohabitations. And I know it's hard to read when you see the whole page, but let me zoom in a bit. So here is an entry for Charles Duvall, who is married to Mary Abram. And it says that they joined by note from masters in Kilbert County, Maryland, and it gives their residence. And they cohabitated in December of 1862. And it lists the reverend who did that uh, ceremony. So in this particular record, we are seeing details such as the names of the persons involved, location of their cohabitation, the date in the past, so 1862. Remember, they're documenting these records in 1866. So this is a couple that had been together, um, 1865 and 1866, excuse me, uh, the person who married them, and even notes on the roles of their enslavers. So this is one example. Here's another example, and this looks more like a register listing where we have columns and the details are filled out. So I'll, again, zoom in. What we see is we have a column for the husband's name, a column for the wife, the date of marriage. So the first entry here, I believe, says 1859. Again, these are documented in 1865, so we're capturing cohabitations from the past. Yeah. Who performed it? and the number of children they had. So this couple had two children and notes on their residence. So you see the type of details that we get from this record. All right. Was there a question that you were about to comment on? Or? Okay. No, Sorry. no, it was great. This, I just was, I just was um, supporting you to saying that these are registers from before. And so this yes. happened well, and it, it's not necessarily, and we, we call them marriage registers because the event happened in the past, and it's just being registered now. It's not yes. the marriage event itself. Right, right. Now, we do have other examples though where it actually is more of a marriage itself. So here in DC, we have examples of a marriage license that's being issued because that was one of the roles that the Bureau took on is the couple could come and say, we've married. So they would give licenses in some cases and say, okay, now you can go get that legitimized. And they were asked to 
marry again. So this is an example of that particular situation. So we have this couple getting a license, um, and this is in D.C. And so we have the name of the person who's signing off on it from the Bureau. And this is, is given to a clergy person of the clergy or minister of the gospel who can then officiate that remarriage of the couple. So you see this variety just in one location, D.C. <laughs> now. Let's look at Louisiana. Louisiana has some interesting examples. Their information is a little bit more detailed. So I know it might be hard to read everything here on the slide, but I'll kind of walk through this. So here we have a notice that on this day, this couple was united, Elijah and Elvina. It looks like her name is. They're from Louisiana. And the date was March 18th, 1865. It has their ages. He was 50. And it has their color. So it says he was black. It also has the color of their parents. His father's black, his mother's black. There's an option to say if that person had another relationship in the past. So he had not, but 49-year-old Elvina, who is black and her father's black and her mother's black, had lived with another man for 10 years. Um, and there's a spot for children, but there's no children in this particular instance. So you see the level of detail is different. Mm. If we look at the Mississippi, they had a similar form. And in this case, it's not all completely filled out, but this couple, um, there was one child that this couple had had. So that was documented on their particular uh, um, entry of their form. So again, the, the, there's commonality between the form used in the Mississippi and Louisiana. But when we look at Kentucky, it's even different. So this is out of Owensboro, Davies County, Kentucky, June 30th, 1866. In this case, their documentation served to highlight the fact that the couple had been together for at least two years. So they would put the person's name and say, okay, we document that they've been together in the state for two years or more. So we don't get the day that they actually, the year they cohabitated, but we know that they've been cohabitating for at least two years. That's an interesting so, term, after the old fashioned in this state. I after the old fashioned in this state, exactly. <laughs> I had not heard that term either. So it's really interesting to see such variety. Now, when we look at Virginia, and Virginia has a lot of Freedmen Bureau's records. So if we're using this database and you're from Virginia, you have a lot to explore. Um, so this is a listing of the couple's names. So Jack Booth is 59, Betsy Morris is 39. It has, well, I, I use the phrase current mar marital status. I guess that's to say their marital status up till now, right? So he had been widowed, she was single. Um, and it lists their parents' names. So his parents are Jack and Annie. Her parents are Grimes and Polly. Imagine being descended from this couple and finding this, right? To have documentation of their parents. It has their location, the number of children, even like who, who those children belong to. In Jack and Betsy's case, there was two children that were his and then his occupation. So it's, it's nice to see just this variety that we get. And here's another example out of Virginia where we get the name, ages of the people involved, occupation, residence, and remarks. And the remarks tended to be information about children. So mm -hmm. very bountiful sources of, of records. And just my last Virginia example is another kind of register listing where we have the names, the ages, and information on their location. So you'll get a gamut of results if you're exploring these databases. And no location is going to be exactly the same as the other. You know, it depends on just where you are. Any other questions before I switch to North Carolina? What do yeah, you, what there, do you there were, yeah and, and I'm glad you're doing it before you go to North Carolina because mm -hmm. Nina Davis asked, um, do we have information on when Texas legalized marriage records? And I know you might not know that like off the top of your head, but I will point people to the resource of the Family Search Research Wiki. So yes. if you want to know when certain vital records became available in a certain state, you can go to familysearch.org. You can search for our research wiki and put in, for example, Texas marriage records, and it will tell you more about when, you know, the details about how the state um, collected that information on a statewide basis. It will refer you if it was county by county, various things like that. So if you need to know exactly when records were available for your state, I always point people to the Family Search Research Wiki. Or honestly, you can go to Google. I mean, Google will point you to Family Search, will point you to Ancestry, will point you to some maybe Texas archive um, information as well. And so there's a breadth of information out there to answer those questions. So 
you know, obviously come to the Family Search Wiki. I'm going to promote because I'm Family Search, or look, you know, Google it, and that should be able to help direct you to to know that kind of information. Yeah, that's that's very helpful because I use the wiki all the time. <laughs> so, all right. So what we've done is just kind of walk through the Freeman's Bureau records, right? So I mentioned when I was talking about the variety from state to state that if you're in North Carolina, oh, you're in a special category if you have roots to North Carolina because of the fact that they mandated it by law. So Family Search has great resources for North Carolina cohabitation records that we're going to talk about now. All right, make sure I can get my slide advancing. All right, so in 1866, the North Carolina General Assembly did enact this legislation that ordered those that were formerly enslaved to register. So this is an excerpt from the public laws of the state of North Carolina that were passed. And it says that in all cases where men and women were lately slaves and now emancipated and cohabitate, they shall be deemed to be lawfully married. And the second box points out that they were to go before the clerk of the uh, court of pleas and court of sessions of the county in which they reside. They were to go to the office, declare that they were cohabitated as a partner or a couple partnership, and then that, that partnership would be registered into the county records. It cost 25 cents to do this, and it was actually later made a, mis it was made a misdemeanor if you didn't do it. So because of that, there are a lot of documented North Carolina cohabitations. But to speak to the question answered earlier, it still wasn't everybody, but it's, it's a large body of data. Mm -hmm. In fact, more than 22,000 couples from 54 counties across the state registered. Um, Dr. White in her book highlights all the counties that were included. And so I made this visualization and put a star on all the counties because, right, it's family history. We're geographically inclined. And I know that this helps me. So I wanted to offer it as a way to help others. So that way you can look at a region and everywhere there's a gold star, there are cohabitations in that county that you can research or that are available for us to explore. Um, so I, I made this visualization just to make it a little bit easier to, to know which counties are covered. Now, there's a few, there's a couple of ways on the Family Search website to get to the North Carolina cohabitation records. I will start here with this link from the <laughs> Family Search Wiki <laughs> for North Carolina cohabitation records. And when you go here, you're going to get the list organized by county along with a link to the um, catalog record for that Family Search library film. So in this particular case, let's say I'm interested in looking at the cohabitation records for Beaufort County. I would select it, and then I go to the catalog record for that. At this point, I can check to see, you know, the link, the camera icon. Can I go see these images online? In this case, I can. And so I would click on the camera icon and get the images loaded for me on the screen. So at this point, I could open up an image and get right to the record. And so you can see the handwritten uh, documentation of these cohabitations in that county. Now, you may not want to scroll image by image, right? You don't always, you don't need to do that. But in case you have an interest, you can. Now, fortunately, we have a searchable database with a lot of these cohabitation records. And Tom, I think this is the best thing ever. <laughs> so, so do I. This, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so. This database is the North Carolina County Marriages Set, and it covers 1762 to 1979. Now, this database is not just cohabitation registers, but it includes the cohabitation reg registers from the state. So you'll find other marriages from, you know, other documented marriages, but the cohabitation registers that Family Search has are in here. Now, that Teresa Beckman came mm -hmm. with the question. Yes. Were these marriage licenses um, given to couples by local churches as well, or civil governments, or was it just one jurisdiction? Like, did, are, are, what's all in this? Okay, good question. So in the case of North Carolina, you had to go to the county in which you resided and go to the county clerk. Okay. So it okay. wasn't done at the churches. You had to go to the county clerk. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a civil government county yes. clerk or the one jurisdiction for that. Hopefully that answers your 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 um your question Therese. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. 
All right, so once you are in the database, you know, every time I click out, all right, once you're in the database, you can do a search. And I've done a search here. So here goes my search for Della Battles, my fourth grade grandmother. And then I see her entry is here. So I can click on the little note icon at the end of the row and actually bring up the record. And as you see, I have the details of the record as well as the image that I showed you earlier at the top of the presentation. I could click on it and go see it in detail. So this is actually how, what, how I came across it is being able to see that it's in this database. So this is a fantastic resource to know about and to use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, just like I talked about, there was variation from state to state as the Freemans Bureau collected their records. And even though the state of North Carolina mandated that people go document their, their cohabitations, there's still incredible variation from county to county, even in the North Carolina records. I mentioned uh, Dr. White's book earlier, Somebody Knows My Name. So in her introduction, she has a very descriptive overview of this variation. And I really encourage you to go read if you want to know more. And the North Carolina Genealogical Society has had her permission to post the introduction online. So I do have a link here. Um, and remember, I'm sharing my slides if you want it in case you don't, you know, are able to capture this link while we're watching. But definitely go read her introduction because you'll get a, a really good detailed description of the variation that exists county to county. Even I, I remember even reading one person who charged more than that 25 cent. <laughs> he was charging, I think, 35 I'm, cents, she said. I'm, I'm to make you <laughs> yep. So I just have a screenshot to show you examples of different cohabitation records across the state. Um, so you'll see everything from these, you know, handwritten uh, notes of describing the cohabitation to um, forms that are not as descriptive perhaps, but give you the name. Um, you'll see register listings. So it really will vary. Every county might be a little bit different, but it's definitely worth exploring and getting familiar with. So, you know, I hoped this has been a, a nice overview to really just have us all thinking about how important and meaningful these cohabitation records can be. You know, I shared my personal case study. I've got many other examples in my own family history of using these cohabitation records. Um, the Freemans Bureau was instrumental in this. So I, I hope that sharing some of that history helps you better understand the context around the creation of the records. It's really good to know that we have instances where state laws were mandated. And so we have more records available to us during this time period where you know, formerly enslaved or really working to establish their citizenship. And I'm thankful for the resources from Family Search that helped collate this all for us and make it searchable and accessible. Just recognize no two marriage license or cohabitation records or uh, union records are necessarily going to be the same. There's variety, um, but we can learn from that as we think about how our ancestors uh, lived. Um, so Again, I mentioned you can request a copy of my slides and the link has been shared, but the link is also posted oh. here. Yes. I was, that's what I was going to say. Let me, let me do, I'm going to go. Wanna, okay. Because <laughs> so, I missed the link earlier and, and I've been asking yes. our uh, the women okay. in the back trying to help us to make yes. sure we have that for everyone. And so everyone get your phone out right now. That's right. You can scan the QR code. Fill out the code. form. So I'm scanning it right now myself. <laughs> And I'm going to it where I can get these slides. This is all right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here. All right. I got on the request Juneteenth cohabitation record slides. So I'm going to put my name in there and I'm going to put my email Great. address in there and go over. <laughs> People are seeing me do this in real time. Hopefully you can do it as well. <laughs> or take a screenshot. If you're on your, um, computer at home and know how to take a screenshot or grab your phone and take a picture of this page to be able to get this. If you can't scan the QR code right here, this is how you can request these slides. This is amazing information that you provided to me. Yep. Thank you. Okay. I got your request, Tom. Hey, there you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, you but you know, people, you know, I wanted to make the slides accessible because it's not always easy sometimes to, it's great that we can come back and watch online, but I know people sometimes really want it, except in their own personal library. So I'm happy to share the slides and you'll have the hyperlinks to everything that I've mentioned um, and, and the 
resources that I've included. So well, I'm very I, glad to I, do I would that. really intrigued by that that map you had of the counties in North Carolina <laughs> and where cohabitation records exist. I think that'd be something others might want to use, you know, yes. in handy as well. So yes, yes absolutely. come back, watch this presentation. But but I think you've got a little sneak pre <laughs> sneak preview for some oh, people. Oh yes. <laughs> That we've been sitting on for the last couple of weeks. All right, we have an announcement, y'all. Drum roll. I don't know if you can hear my drum roll. <laughs> but we have an announcement. All right, for the North Carolina cohabitation records, you can help add and make sure more get added online. So just now, as we've been talking, a fresh new batch of cohabitation register records or records are been made available on the Family Search website for us to log in, participate, help volunteer, and get them indexed. And I actually will show the page now. So here's the page. U.S. North Carolina Marriages and Cohabitations, 1848 to so you will be able to sign up to help index these important, very important and incredibly valuable records for our African-American ancestor research. So this is exciting. I was so glad, Tom, when you said that this was coming because it's very important to do this. Yeah, we, we've been working with um, one of the industry leaders um, as well on this specific collection. They, they've approached us and said, hey, this would be helpful as we do some kind of general research of North Carolina, knowing that these records exist, knowing that they've been digitized, they're available on Family Search, is there a way to get them indexed? And for people who maybe aren't familiar with indexing, it's how we take the digital images that we've taken and then adding them to the database to make them searchable by name, by extracting or transcribing the information from those records. So in this case, with these cohabitation records, you have the project description and what to index. It's gathering the names, the dates, places, and any other pertinent information that you put into our indexing form. And then once it's completed, then it will be searchable. If you go on Family Search and hit search and look for the North Carolina cohabitation records, it'll be added to that collection. And then you could search for those individual people by, by name. Tania showed earlier how you can actually browse the film and look page by page, but this makes it more targeted for your search. And you as an indexer are the reason why you're making these records more readily available to others that are searching for their ancestors. What, a, what better way to give back to our ancestors on Juneteenth than to not only say their name, but to record their name and make their names available to their descendants through indexing collections like this. This isn't the only one Absolutely. available on there. That we we help oh, yeah. all y'all, mm -hmm. but there are so many more collections that can mm -hmm. be indexed on Family Search from around the world. This specific collection is uh, focused on the US. So if you're joining us, like I've seen people from the UK, from Aruba, from Jamaica, from all over the world, unfortunately, this collection is only available to indexers who are in the United States at this time. But if you're from those other countries, look, go to the Get Involved, look up indexing, search for projects that may be available in your um, area as well. And as Flora asks, can we volunteer even for beginners and not in North Carolina? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's an easy thing. I got an 11-year-old daughter at home who loves to index, who loves to help out. So Flora, you can do it. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be an expert. These records tend to be, as you've seen Tania show, they tend to be, you know, tabular in format, they, you know, in columns and, and tend to be very, you know, readable. Yes, they are in cursive. So some of them younger folk may not be able to read the <laughs> cursive, but that's when you get the granddaughter to work with the grandmama to put these online and make them available for other people. So please join us and help with this. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see this come online even more and just continue to build up the resources that we have available to us. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Tania, I, I just appreciate all the work that you're doing to help in North Carolina, specifically your area of expertise and, and, and all the things you're, you're helping with there. Um, and I just appreciate everybody that's out there that's trying to do this work, that's trying to help us you know, connect with our ancestors and really discover our heritage. I've got another question that's coming here. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to read it. So Linda, Linda Shacklin Jackson 
says, I had access to a stash of multi-generational family records in Bedford County, Tennessee. There were many references to enslaved people by first name only. Would this be of any interest or help and how? You you tell me what you think. And then okay. I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> All right. So my response to that is yes, it's absolutely of interest to share records that you may have that may not be available to other places. One way I do that is through the Family Search Family Tree, <laughs> because I really enjoy looking up people's profiles and adding sources to those profiles, such as the records you have, because then it becomes saved by family search permanently and it's out there for the community to leverage so um, that's just one way you can share absolutely and <laughs> and specifically we've added a feature on family search in the family tree called other relationships we won't have the time to get into it today <laughs> but through other relationships we're documenting non-familial relationships things like apprenticeships things like godparents, things like, uh, you know, um, we heard learned earlier from Karen Strickland about friends, associates, and neighbors, but also about the relationship between an enslaved person and a slaveholder, where you can actually say, this person was the slaveholder, this person was the enslaved person, and they're now connected permanently within our family tree structure. And so that is, Linda, that is absolutely of interest to us. We've yes. built this feature to allow those who are doing research on maybe their enslaved ancestors, because a lot of times, Tania, you know, in, in enslaved ancestor research, it's connecting to the slaveholder or overseer or plantation where that person was. That's the kind of breakthrough in many instances to the brick walls that have existed in the past. If you can tie an enslaved person to a slaveholder, in many ways you can go back further generations or at least understand their origins better. And by yeah. using this other relationships feature on Family Search, you can get that. So Linda, I hope this, this answers your question. We got a couple more questions, so I'm gonna keep them coming. Okay, yeah. Um, you, you, I think you hit this earlier, but Monica Guzman asked that she pulled up cohabitation records on the Family Search Wiki but didn't see Louisiana listed and do they even exist? And what about for Texas? Okay, what, so what yes, Ma <laughs> Monica, great question. And so, yes, um, I did, oh, here, let me come back and I'm gonna show you. I would refer you to the database from Family Search, this one. Um, Freeman's Bureau of Marriage Records, 1861 to 1872. You will find some Louisiana records in here. Um, now, not Texas, but Louisiana at least is partially represented. And I don't remember the exact scenario with Texas, but on one of the other slides, I have a resource to the National Archives publication. They talk about the work that was done in Texas. But, you know, unfortunately at this time, Texas is not as well represented online, um, but you can read that source. It's from the National Archives. And as for my slides, you'll have the link um, yeah. and then you'll be able to get to that and learn more about Texas in particular. Yeah, because you did have the link there to the National mm -hmm. Archives, the Reginald yes. Watson's um, article there. Yes. So thank you, Monica, for that. I've got another question from I. DeGee, and it says, I'd like to see the Freedmen's Bureau um, Index for Tennessee. Interesting. So, so Tennessee is one of the states that yes. should be in the Freeman Bureau records. And so yes. um, the way that we indexed them when we did this project that, that kind of culminated in the 1,781,463 <laughs> names uh, back in 2016 was Oops. we did it actually by record types. And so if you're looking for Tennessee, you can't look necessarily for state and all the Freeman Bureau records that are there, but you can look for the type of record and then, and then filter your records to look for what records were available in Tennessee. So it could be labor contracts in Tennessee. It could be ration records in Tennessee. It could be education records in Tennessee. We, we tried to cover all the 15 states and District of Columbia for the various record types. Now that's the indexed collections. You can look at all the records that are all browsable by looking at, for example, Tennessee Assistant Commissioner records, and you can go through all the pages of records that are organized by the state of Tennessee. So I thank you for, for um, yeah. watching us on Facebook. I hope this kind of directs you to the right place. If you need any help at all, I'm gonna give a plug for our Family Search Centers. So there are over 5,000 Family Search Centers worldwide where you can go into a physical building where we have volunteers that are there that can help you and maybe guide you to some of these resources like the Freedman Bureau records in Tennessee, 
or you can even go search on um, familysearch.org and, and look at getting a virtual consultation where you can meet virtually with someone's uh, service that we provided now during COVID to help people be able to get some research assistance when they can't necessarily make it to a location in person yeah. to meet with anyone. Yeah. That's so, incredibly valuable to have that. So thanks. So yeah, we need all kind of links for all this. Stuff. <laughs> going back to Facebook, going back to YouTube. Adding links, yep. All, adding links to all these and everything. Mia, this has been just a perfect. This is exactly what I envisioned and what the Roots Tech team envisioned when we thought about having classes today. Thank you so much yeah. for your yeah. contribution to this, to this well, great work that we're both involved in. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. Um, and, you know, it was helpful for me, too, because now I have, hey, if someone asked a question in the future, here you go. Here's a whole presentation in class about it. You can watch on the Roots Tech site. So I Absolutely. appreciate being part of it. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for watching. This was class number four. We do have two <laughs> more, two of two. We have six classes total today. So we hope that you'll come back. We'll be meeting again at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. Eastern, and then at, at 3 p.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. Eastern for our next two classes. But thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Hundreds of people from all over the world, we appreciate you joining us on Juneteenth. Take care now. Absolutely.